I think every minister enjoys the opportunity to talk about love because um, it's one topic that everyone enjoys and rather than things like sin or hell or things where you can make enemies, usually when you talk about love, it's something of a topic that people enjoy hearing about. And I don't think today will be any different. I think there's so many aspects of love that we don't know and don't understand and yet can benefit from knowing more about that um, it's uh, an enjoyable topic. And I did a little bit of research because I didn't want to just pull from my own knowledge of things. I like to look and see what others say. And I found an article I'd never seen before which actually popped up in a secular publication uh, called Psychology Today. And uh, Psychology Today, according to them, there are seven types of love. Now, again, depending on who you talk to, there are always so many different types. But according to psychology today, there are seven types of love. And they define them this way. There is eros, which is sexual or passionate love, a type most akin to our modern construction of romantic love. It's also a very good cologne, by the way, if you ever have an opportunity <laughs> to smell that one. But... Um, then there's philea, which many call, um, you know, associate with the church in Philadelphia, and that's the brotherly love, comes from friendship, shared goodwill. And so these words are thrown out, and often, of course, anytime we use the word love, depending on the context, we have to judge which type of love is being talked about. So those are two. And then um, the third is storge, that's how you pronounce it. It's spelt like storage without the A. Storge, which is a familial or family love, a kind of love between a parent and a child. So when a parent and child say, I love you to one another, that's where this comes from. And then the one that we would commonly use in a church setting is agape love. We like that one. Uh, there's even a bookstore chain in America called the Agape Christian Bookstores, and they're uh, quite a big one. Agape is universal love, such as the love of strangers, nature, or God. It's also called charity by some, so it would come up in 1 Corinthians 13 often. And, of course, that is love demonstrated, so charity gets its root from that. Uh, it's an unselfish type of love, concern for the welfare of other people. Now, that's really where I would have stopped. I would have come to the conclusion of those four. But they have some others, and they're very good points. Ludus. It's a playful and uncommitted type of love, a flirting, seducing, and other things, um, type of love. And it's interesting because I've used this illustration when I've talked to dating couples and ones where, you know, you'll have somebody say, but he said he loved me, you know, and, and, and then to define what they mean by that because you don't want to find yourself saying he doesn't, you know, it's just all a lie. Uh, you don't want to do that because there, there is a sense within them of saying I love you, but uh, I liken it to this. I liken it to a person who eats, uh, I'll use this as no a Snickers bar, you know. And I say, oh, I love Snickers bars, you know. But what they do with that is, of course, they rip open the package, they eat the Snickers bar, and then they discard the package, and that's it. That's their sense of love. The satisfaction of saying, I love you, and then they throw it away, and they forget about it. So you'd say there's no commitment to that love. It's just something that comes up quickly and disappears just as quickly. They also throw out the word pragma, which is practical love, founded on reason or duty, one's long-term interests. And for that type of love, sexual attraction takes a back seat in favor of personal qualities and compatibilities, shared goals, make it work. And so you have that type of love where people say, the reason that I do what I do is because I, and they would use the term generally, love people. Now there's no sense of commitment, there's a duty and a responsibility and, and something that says, I um, have so much and so for me to give, it's because I love people, I love the opportunity to serve others, and that would fit within the context of pragma. And then I'm going to mispronounce this one, 
philatia, philatia, which they had, they define this as self love. Ah, interesting. And self love can be both healthy and unhealthy. And this is argued in Christian circles for has been for years. Just how deep should we love ourselves? And there are some who say you shouldn't. You should never love yourself. You know, loving yourself means that you don't love God and, and you need to, you know, throw yourself aside and cast yourself aside. Then you have other people who say, hang on a minute, you're destroying self-esteem. You're destroying God's creation of you. And there's that verse in the scripture that says, love others as you love yourself. And how can I love others if I don't love myself? And this argument goes back and forth and back and forth. But it is true that you have to have that love in balance in order for it to work. You need a sense of balance between how much that you appreciate what God's done in your life, that you have a sense of self-worth, and we might say self-love, that can also then allow us to serve other people and love other people because we care for ourselves, we care for them. So I thought it was interesting. I mean, you know, this is psychology today, and they're coming out with some pretty good things, and I hadn't heard some of them before. Uh, but then we look at what the scripture says. What does God say? Where is the root of all of this? You're in 1 John 4, and let's um, look beginning in verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, verse 10, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice. Still love the King James word propitiation. It just has a better sound. A self-atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Let's just jump down to verse 16. I want to read this verse. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. Before we go any further, let's just commit this and what we've read to the Lord. And let's just pray, shall we? Father, the topic of love is the topic of God, of you. And we want to understand it better. We want to have a, a better sense of what you mean when you say love. We know that for some it's uh, very superficial, very on the surface and doesn't have much meaning. And yet, for others, it has a depth of meaning that is uh, beyond explanation. It's beyond our words when we say how much we love somebody, care for somebody. So, Father, help us to just get a glimpse of what you mean by love and what it can mean for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I picked a photo for our slide that I thought was reflective of celebration and happiness and you know when we have the the word love in our own minds we um, we don't think in the depth of what sometimes scripture would talk to us about we just think of it as a, a sense of happiness and commitment and and um, a relationship with someone and I think throughout scripture what I tried to avoid with the message this morning which is what I sometimes don't avoid which is to really get into the depth of this you know and pull out the Greek pull out the original meanings and the original language and get down to what God is really saying in the depth of the passage and I think 
you know, for the average Joe, you know, for those of us who just want to read this passage, love ought to be that word that we can say and understand and not have to delve within the depths of it. There was an old Methodist evangelist by the name of Sam Jones, and he was constantly being criticized by other evangelists and ministers saying, you know, you're so shallow. You know, you just never get into any real depth. And and he said, you know, why don't you get into the Greek? And uh, and he was, of course, very simple-minded, but very profound as well. And, you know, he came up with the phrase. He said, you know, when I can get to the depths of the English, then I'll go into the depths of the Greek, you know. <laughs> And, uh, and, and then behind their backs, when he got home, he actually said, you know, I'd rather be in heaven reading my ABCs than sitting in hell reading Greek. <laughs> so he had this idea that sometimes the depth can lose more than anything else. So I didn't want to do that this morning. I just want to look at what love is and what it can mean for us that makes it really important. In verse 18, and you don't even have to look at all of these passages, but if you're taking notes and want to write them down, that's fine. But 1 John 4, 18 says these words, there is no fear in love. I love that. I really like the fact that within love, there's no fear. In our relationships today, we have this ability to sum people up really quickly. We have to. You know, we go in and talk to a salesperson about buying something, and of course we're ready to spend, in some cases, quite a large sum of money. And so we look to try to get somebody that we're talking to that we can we can trust. There's an element of saying, you know, they're not going to take me for a ride. They're not going to, you know, cheat me somehow. They're going to be honest with me. And, and um, there is that in some people that says, I'm too trusting. They trust everybody. And uh, I had a dad like that, you know. And if you have parents who are like that, you worry about them all the time. You know, it's like, oh, dad, I know you just, the guy's taking you for a ride. And you, you've got to be careful. And you can't just trust everything they say. And, you know, and he says, oh, he's such a nice guy. And, oh, dad. You, know, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you just really want to drive home the fact that you've got you to gotta really have that you know, check them out, you know, read the reviews, don't just take and buy something. You ever bought something off the internet and then looked at the reviews after you bought it? Oh, no. You know, I've booked places where I was going to stay and they looked like they were good. And then I read the reviews and went, oh, no, where am I going to stay? But sometimes doing a little bit of research, we can get to the point where we trust them. And within love, there's no fear. Within love, you can, you can get to the point where you drop your guard. That's how I like to think of it. When you really can drop your guard. I don't have to be anything but myself. I can just love. I can just know that, you know, it's, it's like we used to say in computers in the olden days, WYSIWYG, you know, what you see is what you get. It's just that idea that it's just, there's just a simple on the surface depth of commitment and love that says i'm not i'm not afraid i'm not afraid and of course god drives home the fact to us that with our relationship with him we can trust him and i say that and you say yeah of course obviously duh um, but really when it comes down to it sometimes we forget that god has our best interests at heart you know, sometimes when we pray, we have to be careful, we think. We have to be careful in what we say because we're afraid if we don't say it just right, God might not give us exactly what we need. He might trick us and, and give us some, you know. We do this. We really don't completely trust him even though we say we do. And God says, no, I, you know, there's no fear in love. And in me, there's no fear. You can trust that actually I want more and better for you than you want for you. <coughs> Have you ever known somebody that you would love to see commit their life to Christ? And, and you spend time praying for them. Or maybe they've strayed away from the Lord and you want to pray to have them come back. And you spend time and you, and you want to get it right because you, you want God's attention. 
and you want him to take you seriously, and you want him to be able to know that you really, really want to see them come back to the Lord or come to Christ, and so you try really hard to get your wording just right to make sure he takes you seriously. And it's because you forget that actually God wants them to come back more than you do. God wants them to come to him more than you do. And you're not really just introducing God to the idea. You're agreeing with him, you know, to see the person come back to the Lord. Because within him, there's the context of saying, I will draw men to myself if you just lift me up. And so there is this sense of saying God has our best interests at heart even more than we do. There's another verse in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Again, if you want to turn, you may, a few pages away. But it uses these words. Oh, I have to say I really like this verse. It says, love covers a multitude of sins. You know, if if someone loves you, they can put up with a lot. That's how we would, you know, put it today. Especially when you get into a husband-wife relationship, you know. And you get to the point where you think, um, especially it comes out at birthdays or when you address a card, you know, thank you for putting up with me. You know, thank you for tolerating all of my shortcomings and all the times when I fail. And... Uh, and, and there are multitudes of times. I'm worse than most. That's why you chose me to stand up here, so it will make you feel good. I know. <laughs> you know but when, when you get to the point where you say, I know how bad I am. I will leave the house and go for milk to the store and come back without milk. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, that's why I left. And I'll come back with something else. And I don't come back with what I, what I left for. And there's all those times, and they stack one upon another. But love covers a multitude of sins. Now, that's a small win. But when somebody really loves somebody else, you read about this in the newspaper. You hear about this occasionally in the news. When somebody murders someone else, and you find somebody say, I forgave them. You think, whoa, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's tough. I don't know that I can do what they did. But there is a sense that says, actually, you know, for the greater good of what all this means, I found it within me to forgive them for what they've done. Love is the only way that could be possible. Because love is the only thing that can cover that multitude of sins. And I won't belabor that point because you know it well. Colossians chapter 3 verse 14 talks about love binds us together in unity. Um, I've said this before. I like this illustration. I heard it from a Canadian preacher in um, Windsor, Ontario. And he used to talk about how that when we introduce ourselves to other people, we have a way of asking the first question, which unites us. The second question usually divides us. We'll say, you know, are you a Christian? And if they respond with yes, that unites us. Suddenly there's a unity, and we say, ah, you know, I am too. Second question that we often ask is, oh, what church do you go to? <laughs> Suddenly, you know, they'll say, oh, I'm Baptist, oh, I'm Methodist, you know, or oh, I'm charismatic. You, know, you don't have the gift. Whatever it is, there's the suddenly you know, instant div unity and then division. And within love, instead of looking for the differences, in love we look for the things that we have in common with people. Because actually, there's, there are some. There are things that we have in common with people and we can find a reason to love them. Now, in your own mind, obviously you'll have to drift off to be able to do this, and I'll give you permission to do that. But as you drift off in your mind and you're thinking, picture somebody that you personally struggle to get along with for whatever reason. You know, Maybe it's a colleague at work. Maybe it's that one person at the petrol station that you just dread having them be there when you pull in. You know, But there's just probably you know, one person 
just popped into your mind. You knew instantly who, who it was. And you think about that person for a moment. You could easily, if I gave you a pen and piece of paper, you could easily start writing down all the things you don't like about them. It'd be very easy. They'd flow off your tongue. You know, you could easily describe. Maybe they're in your own house. I don't know. But, you know, you could begin to list all of those things. It'd be very easy. But if I turned it around and I said, okay, now find the things about them that you like, you'd struggle for a minute, you know, because it's not something that comes naturally to us. We don't instantly look for things to like about people. Why? Why is our nature that way? But it is. When we see people, we don't look at what keeps us together. We look at what divides us. I'll give you a public figure so you can play with this in your mind. I can't think of very many people right now in Britain who are very fond of Donald Trump, for instance. Okay. I mean, if I gave you a piece of paper and said, what don't you like about him? You could have a heyday, you know, just writing down all the things from his hair to, you know, whatever it would be. You could just list the things. But if I were to say to you, what do you like about Donald Trump? First of all, you know, you'd find that almost an offensive question because I'm just not supposed to. You know, but, but if I said to you something like that and you strained for just a moment, you could come up with things that you would say, well, you know, I like walls, not where he wants to build them and not the reason he wants, whatever. You would find reasons and things about the person that you would like. I pull all of that because this is what love gives us the ability to do in all areas of our life. It gives us the ability to find things about people to like. Find things about people that can pull us together instead of pulling us apart. Find things about people that we can actually love, even when we don't love them. This is what love does. Love has the ability to bind together. Then we look at some of the characteristics of God and we see why love is important. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3, there is reference made to God's love for us. And he says words we don't even understand. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. An everlasting love. When we think of the word everlasting, because we're finite people, finite human beings, we always think forward. Okay, From this point forward, when you receive Christ as your Savior, God gives you everlasting or eternal life. We think, I have received life, and from this point forward, I will have life that never ends. But for God... He is outside of the realm of time. And so for God, it isn't just forward, it's forward and backwards. Uh, When I did my thesis when I was in um, seminary, I used um, the content of the eternal present tense of God. And I loved the verses in the scripture which don't make sense, like when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. You know, it's not, hang on, you can't. But this is because God is outside of the realm of time and space. I have loved sitting in the ruins of um, an old abbey. Maybe you think that's weird, but I kind of enjoy visiting places like that. And then sitting where the abbot sat, you know, on the stones. Of course, there's nothing there. There's just walls and things. And you think, you know, God can look down and see. And I'm sitting on top of the guy. I mean, it's a bit weird to think of it that way. But I, he can actually see, you know, the context of things, present, future, past, all kind of at the same time because he creates this realm. And I can pray. And I'm praying. And, and if I pray from that spot, I'd be praying in the same spot that other people have prayed. And I think that's kind of cool, just thinking of the the fact that God sees this all and and can love it and see it in a in a everlasting context. So I've also done this, and you'll think this is extremely weird. I've also done this, stood on a mountain of a druid worship site where you know they actually 
you know, sacrificed people. And I've sat there and I've prayed. And I think, for God, he kind of looks at this and it, and I think, I wonder if this is why he didn't destroy it all. Because in the context of all of it, he sees it all at the same time. And for God, it's an everlasting context. And, and then that makes me think, if I've got that kind of power, this is where my thought goes. If I have that kind of power, where do I want to take it? And what do I want to do? Where do I want to, listen, where do I want to take love where at the moment there's hate? Where do I want to go and in front of God and in, and in front of the everlasting context of life? Where do I want to go and I want to spread love? I want to share the gospel. I want to be able to do something good in a spot where evil took place. Maybe some of you did what I did and think of places like Auschwitz. Think, oh, wow. What would it be like to be able to go to a place like that where you know there was evil? And, and, and bring love into a place like that. You know, think, think of those who, who Christ said from the cross, used words like, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And you think, you know, bringing into the context of that. And all I say that for is because love is an extremely powerful thing. Love gives us the ability to bring good into evil, bring good into a uh, good into an evil world and into an evil context. So the power that comes out at Christmas time, especially thinking about all these things, hope and peace and joy and love, is the fact that we can kind of, you know, envelop or envelope an entire world full of things that are attributes of what God brings to us. We can bring love. We can bring happiness. We can bring party spirit into a world where it's just, you know, Satan is bent on destroying it. And we can bring life where there's death. We can bring hope where there's hopelessness. We can bring peace where there's war. We can bring all. We can bring joy where there's sadness. We have this ability in God to bring what's absent. Because in him, if we bring him in, we've brought it in. We've brought in love. Now consider your own life, and I'll say this in closing. I don't know about you, but looking back at my own testimony in life, I would say that even as a teenager, because I was quite young when I received Christ, um, there were a lot of things absent from my life that God brought in when he saved me. He gave me a, the ability to see that I could actually be different from who I was. I could be a different person than the person that I was. And I could actually bring hope and love where I didn't feel like there was any. And all of that came because he introduced me to it. If you know Christ as your Savior, then you can relate your story. You can think back to what he brought into your life and then how you can take that and share it with other people and make others see the love and hope and joy and peace that he's brought to you. And by that, you know, we say that's what Christmas is all about. It just reminds us the fact that when Jesus was born as a, as a babe and placed in a manger, he, he was God giving to us love. We read the verse, there is no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Amen.